Okay, morning everyone. Welcome along to Ask the Doc this week. It's with our uh, very own Phil Cooper and welcome back to everyone that was with us for our first one of these sessions last week with Alan Johnston. We had some really fantastic feedback from last week. So thank you ever, ever so much for everyone that offered us that and for, for coming along. Um, so yeah, welcome back if you were here last week. If you weren't here and you'd like to catch up with the session that we did with Dr. Alan Johnston, what I'll do shortly is post the link to that YouTube recording on the chat panel in this webinar so that you can uh, catch up with that in your own time. It was a really, really valuable session, as I'm sure this morning's is gonna be. Um, so before I hand over to Angela, who's our host this morning, um, I will just do a little bit of housekeeping for those of you that might not yet be familiar with Zoom, although I'd be amazed if, uh, if, if anyone hasn't yet uh, been on Zoom much in the last few weeks. Um, so hopefully you'll see our speaker at any point, and that might be Angela, our host, it might be Phil, obviously our guest this morning, or it might be myself as co-host. Um, and also you should be able to, most of the time, see the slides that, uh, that are on screen. Um, that we'll be talking through in the early part of the session. Um, there is, towards the bottom of your screen, a number of tabs, I believe, that you can activate. One of them is the chat panel, uh, which I mentioned before, so I will post certain links into there. Feel free to use that chat if you'd like to um, kind of comment or open up a conversation uh, as a sideline to some of the stuff that Phil's talking about. Uh, and then there's also a Q&A panel, and that is where later on in the sort of second half of the session, really, we'd like you to uh, post your questions for Phil. And uh, I'll sort of monitor those and then kind of hopefully get through all of them if we have time um, in the back end of the session. Uh, other than that, I think it's just a case of familiarizing yourself with Zoom and, and you can kind of choose your own view. So you'll see that you can choose to see the presenter more than the slides or you can move the uh, move the sort of cursor around so that you create uh, the balance of screen that you like. Um, so other than that, I think that's everything. Oh, and the other thing is we've got a couple of polls in this morning's session, so it'll be interactive at certain times and we're gonna ask you to, um, to sort of contribute an answer to a poll. In actual fact, we're gonna kick off with one. So before I hand over to you, Andrew, is that okay if I just launch the first, yeah. the first of the polls? Uh, and this is gonna become relevant um, further on in the, in the talk this morning from Phil. So the first poll of two this morning is about your feelings during lockdown. So I'm going to launch this now. Um, panelists, that's yourself, Phil and Angela, you're also able to vote on this. Um, and the question is, in the last 13 weeks since lockdown began, have you, number one, imagined that things in your life are worse than perhaps they really are? Number two, felt unable to confront your fears? Three, felt that you have behaved differently to normal? Four, avoided dealing with things? Five, had some physical symptoms you could link to how you were feeling at the time. And six, had more negative thoughts than usual and on a more regular basis. Now, this should be multiple choice, hopefully, if I've set it up right. So you should be able to pick more than one of those. So feel free to choose any, any or all that apply to you. Um, so I'll leave this open for a few moments while Angela um, kicks off session. And I'll, uh, I'll come back to the results of this poll when Phil asks me to later on during the presentation. So Angela. Over to you. Thanks, Owen. Well, welcome to the second in our series of Ask the Doc. State of Mind's not only been a fantastic uh, presenter of um, events, if you like, with our amazing speakers and presenters who've helped support countless others by telling stories of their own struggles, but we also have an outstanding panel of clinicians as well with expertise on our board of trustees. And today I'm delighted to introduce one of those experts who also happens to be the man who helped to start State of Mind from the very beginning, nearly 10 years now. He's won many awards for his work in the field of mental health and was awarded the MBE in 2017 for services to nursing. Welcome, Dr. Phil Cooper. Morning, Andrew. Thanks a lot for that. Morning, Owen. Morning, Phil. Phil, your work has made a real difference to many people's lives. Can you just tell us what got you into this field? That's my phone. I'm going to have to stop it. Sorry. <laughs> Can't talk right now. Yeah, what got you into the field of mental health nursing in the first place? Okay, I think uh, from a young age I've always really enjoyed talking to people, which is good, which is handy for my career, I have to say. Uh, but also I think when I was younger, when I was 20, I experienced, uh, uh, unfortunately, a bereavement where I was engaged with a girl who died of cancer, which was a really, really big impact on my life at the time and sparked my interest in mental health and how to try and sort of deal with those situations, but also... I think ultimately after quite a period of time made me think a little bit more about uh, enjoying every day and trying to enjoy every day because obviously life's quite fragile. So 
So in the background for me going into mental health nursing, other than the fact that my sister was a mental health nurse, then um, they were the sort of contributory factors, I think, and I always wanted to do something that helps other people. So I've been uh, really, really fortunate, I think, so far. And your life took a, a pattern or a path in a, in a different direction, sort of almost 10 years ago, like we say, when you started State of Mind. Tell us how that came about, if you would. Okay, yes, yeah, certainly. I think um, at the time, I suppose I'd always thought, uh, you know, it'd be great to combine your passions in life. So obviously my passions are mental health and substance misuse from work, but also I love sport and rugby league's my favourite sport. Uh, so I think at the time, uh, the, the tragedy of... Um, Terry Newton, unfortunately, uh, taking his own life in September 2010, uh, triggered a chain of events, really, which sort of uh, led to State of Mind in coming into existence. Uh, I, I read the Rugby League Express on a Monday morning, Rugby League Express day uh, in my world, because I enjoy Mondays. Uh, and I read an article by a gentleman called Ernie Bembo, who was um, past players chair, I think, at Wigan Warriors. And also a letter from a guy called Malcolm Ray in the same uh, uh, newspaper on that Monday, uh, both basically saying how the NHS and Rugby League should get together just to try and prevent such a tragedy happening again. So uh, with a, a colleague, Caroline, another community mental health nurse, we arranged a meeting with Ernie and Malcolm, uh, Ray, and uh, we got together initially to put a, a conference together, I think it was our very first thing to do. Uh, but then I think Ernie invited Brian Carney, who played with Terry at Wigan, uh, obviously a Sky Sports presenter, and he, bizarrely, I think he linked with Andrew Johns in Australia, who talked about how the, N the NRL in Australia use themed rounds, and whether we should try and ask the Rugby Football League uh, to theme around uh, fixtures around state of mind or mental fitness. And uh, so we put this to the RFL, or Ernie did, with Brian, and then uh, we, uh, I had the strange situation where they said, yeah, we will go for that, because uh, we offered them a free education session for players. So I found myself with Brian Carney driving up the M62 to Hulkington Rovers to, pre to present to all the Super League chief execs to see if they uh, were accepting of the content of the session, which they did. And then uh, everything sort of <laughs> ridiculously grown since that time, really, and um, over 70,000 people have accessed sessions sports clubs, wherever, uh, 400 sessions all over the country, uh, employers, schools, college, university, lots of people, from my point of view, unbelievably have changed their minds around taking their own life. And I suppose that keeps us spurred on every day in state of mind is, can you change one other person's mind about doing something that they can't come back from, so to speak? I think it also captured into something, didn't it, where um, in the past, if people did take their own life, that we still didn't want to talk about things like that. It was kind of really taboo. Um, and this was an initiative that opened things up. It cracked open a veneer, didn't it, and, and allowed people to feel as though they could talk. I think that was the crux of what it was about, especially with men, with strong men. Everybody thought that Terry was dealing with his problems and he wasn't, and all of a sudden now we had um, a platform, if you like, where, come on, it's okay to talk. Let's start talking about this. It was, it was the beginning of something huge. Yeah, I, I always remember when we did the first sessions in the Super League clubs prior to the first round of fixtures, and it was a bit like if anyone's old enough like me to remember Dad's Army, it was a bit like a permission to speak. So once we'd finished the session, we had loads of players and coaches coming up to us saying how they recognise some of the symptoms we've been discussing that we'll discuss again today in some part of this session. Uh, and then saying, you know, what's the best way to get help? And fantastically, from the RFL's point of view, they put in Sporting Chance to support players over the last 10 years. So, yeah, things have changed massively, even to the extent that the Rugby League World Cup next year is going to have a mental fitness charter. Who'd have thought, eh, uh, 10 years ago? And you've got an MBE for all that work as well, Phil. Thank you from me personally, because I'm sure there are people who in my life who might be in a different situation now, but it hadn't been for what you and everybody else got started. So congratulations on that. So let's see if we can continue to sort of help people along the way. In these unprecedented times, we talked last week about the reopening beginning and people going back out into the world and how that might touch on some anxieties. And that's what we're going to focus on today, isn't it? It's stress and anxiety. So we all suffer from stress, every single one of us at some point in our lives. Can you define stress for me, please, Phil? Can you put it in a nutshell? 
Yeah, well, I'll, I'll certainly try to. Uh, I, th I think stress just refers to when um, people have got things, you know, are, are experiencing things at any point in time, really, that, you know, the demands that are made upon them are actually greater than their perceived ability to cope, I think. Lots of people feel overloaded loaded or overwhelmed uh, by whatever's going on around them. And sometimes that's really, really difficult. So I would imagine lots of people, certainly during lockdown, will have noticed some changes that are happening. Certainly guilty of eating more myself, I think. More snackage going on uh, when we're not going out and about. Uh, there's more Zoom quizzes that take place in my world on a Thursday and a Saturday, which may prompt the odd uh, drink of alcohol drinking tea and coffee more so perhaps during the day. Uh, again, people use lots of different things to try and get themselves through the day. So uh, I suppose I know myself when I feel uh, particularly stressed. Uh, I'll certainly my family will tell me that uh, I'll get a little bit more snappy than usual. So, you know, when people ask me something, I'll respond perhaps a bit sharper than I would do usually. I'm usually quite chilled out in what I do. So, uh, so, so all of the things that you can see on the screen there, I suppose lockdown's probably made people feel as though they're not in control of the world around them because of what's happening around us. And that can have big impacts on people day to day. That's it. And you can't make the escapes as you would do normally if you're feeling a bit kind of stressed and know that you, you are biting and irritable. It's not quite as easy just to get out and go to work or go to the shops and all of those things take bigger questions and, and decision making. So it, it kind of becomes a spiral and you end up more stressed than you were in the first place. You can't escape from it. Yeah, massively so, especially because, you know, society put limits on us, what, an hour a day of exercise within a certain location. These are all things that we've never had to sort of deal with before. We normally can go where we like and do what we like, really. Uh, so, so it is massive change for people. And I, and I think there's probably two sides to that as well. We might actually begin to appreciate the fact that we can do those things a little bit more, maybe, as, as the lockdown eases. But because we've been fried to death and thought we all might die, the potential is that's going to scare people. And getting back out into a world where only eight or ten weeks ago people were, everyone was a threat, can make people feel very anxious. And I think that stress is still there for, for many people, even though for others they've seen normality continue and they've been able to go out there. Uh, that, there's a dichotomy there and it causes more stress in other people who feel they are more vulnerable as well. So for every person who feels they're becoming freer, there's somebody else who's feeling as though they're more trapped. Yeah, indeed. It's, it's a weird world, isn't it? Uh, a few weeks ago, we, we might not say hello to people. Now we're thanking people for getting out of our way. It's a strange world, isn't it? So. <laughs> it is a strange world. Okay, so stress is something that um, we all feel. How do we deal with it? This is, this is the thing. We're here to try and give coping me mechanisms to people who feel that stress. Stress is very normal. We all feel it. What are the best ways of dealing with it? Well, well I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of stress is linked to how we view our own self really our, our own self-worth potentially because you know it's normal to feel stress of course and uh, it's normal to want to achieve our goals whatever they may be every day so um, sometimes people will feel more stressed by say I don't know a driving test or exams etc but other people will seem to just breeze through that I think depending on their perception how they view any any particular situation now you know in terms of all our life goals and we've all got different ones whatever they may be they'll be shaped by many things uh, uh, potentially if we don't achieve the goals that we think we should be achieving then there's a potential there that we might perceive that we're failing in some way whatever that might be whether that's relationships families god knows what mates there's a whole range of things that we all worry about day to day uh, being a parent that's one for me i think i think in my career i don't think i've ever met uh, a mum who ever thought they were the greatest mum in the world. Uh, we always tend to blame ourselves if things go wrong as a parent. Uh, so there's lots of things that we set ourselves up for, but it's how, how our self-worth uh, sort of links to that really. So if we think we don't achieve our goals and we're failing all the time, that will increase our stresses. I always remember Michael Jordan, I'm sure some people are watching basketball, Michael Jordan series on Netflix at the moment. And he always talked about the fact that the things that made him successful, the fact that he used to fail all the time. So, I don't know, I think he played, uh, I don't know, he had 9,000 shots, I think, in his career that he missed. Uh, you know, 300 games that they lost and 26 times he was given the opportunity, you know, to take the winning shot in a game, but he missed. Uh, so, so his perspective was that whenever he missed, he would always think, how can I improve from that? And, and I think that's a crucial perception 
of how he didn't feel stressed by that because he always knew a failure would mean further success down the line. So, uh, so, so we, we, we all do different things to cope with stress. I think positive mindset is massive as well, isn't it? It's that ability to sort of like take, like you just exactly give us an example of, take something that is ostensibly ne negative and put it into a positive. Um, and it's easier said than done. How do we change mindsets? And I've not actually told you I was going to ask you that question because it's a big question, but mindset is a huge thing in education, which I'm in at the moment, but in, in sport as well, where performance is everything. Yeah, massively so. I think perception's crucial, I think. Uh, I always remember Barry McDermott telling me uh, an example from when he was younger of uh, being about 19 when he was at Leeds Rhinos. Leeds always played on a Friday night. Uh, and he said after a game, he would always review all the negative things that had happened in a game, dropped passes, missed tackles, etc. Probably penalties he gave away as well, knowing uh, uh, Barry. But, um, but also he said then he wasn't in training until Monday. So he, he would worry and wouldn't sleep all weekend because he was worried about the, the mistakes he'd made and couldn't do anything about it. And I think he bumped into a psychologist at, at the Rhinos who said to him, well, hang on a minute, why don't you just write down on a Friday night after you finish playing all the things that you think you did wrong, put them in a box, literally in a box, post it in a box, put it in the boot of your car, and when you get to training on Monday, that's the time when you can begin to deal with it. And he said it revolutionised his, his, his sleep pattern every weekend. So again, I think perception is really important, I think. And in terms of stress, it's always about, stress is always about something that causes that stress to happen. So if you, if you can't address or are not able to deal with the cause of that stress, and unfortunately, that can build and build, unfortunately. So, so I don't know. So for me, in terms of how I sort of deal with it, I don't know. I told you I'm a bit sad because if I wake up in the morning, I feel okay. And it's going to be a good day and the world's a bonus. But um, and I, I learned how to control my breathing in through my nose and out through my mouth many years ago. So when I get up in the morning, before I have a shower, I'll always uh, do 20 deep breaths. Um, I don't know. It's just become a habit for me realistically now. I've even started doing a plank in the morning since the old... Uh, I think because I'm getting older, thinking perhaps eating too much, I don't know. Um, but I don't know, I, I'm always thinking about what I can do to have a laugh during any one day. I like to soak my feet in a bowl of water and watch a bit of, I don't know, Only Fools and Horses. Uh, I, I'm hoping to write a sitcom in the future. I have no idea if we can do it. Uh, but again, things that it's just an excuse to watch comedy, I think. Uh, but again, going for a walk, going for a run, all those things that I do. And my latest one is I've got a, I've got a coronavirus playlist in my car that I right. sing on. Well, it says, as you say, it's something for everybody. Of all, you'll all find your own ways around it. But like you just mentioned with Barry, sometimes somebody will give you a, a mechanism or, or um, a way of dealing with things that you think, yeah, that will work for me. Mine has always been a mantra. There is always a solution. And once I get my head around that, I know whatever problem I've got, I can deal with. I'm just going to put on the chat, <coughs> excuse me for coughing, um, a little link there because you talked about things that help you relax maybe deep breaths but one of my colleagues at work has started to do mindfulness sessions where she does a lot of that sort of breathing as well and name's Lisa and tonight she has a mindfulness session on YouTube so if anybody wants to join her there that might be for you it's not for me because sitting still is not something I do very very well um, but it is for a lot of other people so there's something to deal with stress we go from stress to something that's a little bit more pernicious i think and also something that we all do have to deal with from time to time is anxiety um tell us about anxiety we did touch on it last week but i want to go more into anxiety because it really does affect lots of people of all ages from children small children to the elderly yeah very much so and i think um again stress is like your precursor to anxiety really so if if you're feeling stressed then you can deal with the cause of that then great then that'll reduce your stress. If those stress, those causes of stresses aren't relieved or resolved at any point, they'll build up and build up. And that can be loads of little things over a, a short period of time or even a long period of time. So, so it's pretty normal to experience anxiety, to say the least, but it's not always a pleasant thing by any means. It affects us all different ways. And, it, and if it continues and continues, if there's no particular cause, then that causes great negative thinking amongst people. So People will start imagining that life's much worse than it is, for example. Uh, the things that they do aren't as good as they should be. Uh, it'll prevent them perhaps from confronting those fears from time to time. But anxiety is definitely normal. 
and it's also um, you know something that potentially will affect everybody physically because it's your physical preparation to, act, to to deal with an anxious situation or a situation that would cause you to feel danger. So sorry, I'm just having a look at the poll results there. So yeah, I've just announced those there, Phil. If you want to talk to some of these, that like every one of those points that exists in the anxiety slide, people have related to some more than others. But yeah, talk through that. Yeah, certainly. Uh, again, <laughs> it's really easy in a lockdown and, and, a, and a worldwide pandemic to think uh, that life's not as good as it's going to, you know, as but was before, and think it may not sort of improve. So. Uh, feeling uncomfortable with fears, perhaps more so than usual, because we've just not faced these type of situations as well. But again, behaving different to normal. So again, you know, that might be a little bit more, uh, I don't know, wary when you're going shopping. So if you're going to a shop, how far is somebody away from you? Is someone going to invade your personal space? All of those things potentially will create different bits of anxiety. And those physical symptoms, you know, can be a whole range of different things with being a you know, like a panic situation where you just produce that response to danger by seeing somebody in a mask or not in a mask, then rather than seeing someone with a machete wandering down the street. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, we've got all those situations that are causing all this negative thinking, crikey, that's a, it's going to be a big effect. And obviously I work in mental health, so we're seeing that coming through now. We just think there's a bit of a tidal wave coming our way after the lockdown eases, unfortunately, because people are all feeling like this. It doesn't matter whether you work as a mental health professional or, or you know, you're, you're just trying to do what you do day to day. I'd like to go into a little bit deeper with this, if you don't mind, Phil, because I think it's, it's interesting and also useful for people to understand that we all feel it. And there's a reason why we all feel it as well. You're not weak if you feel anxious. It's science going on. It's science of the brain. Now, I did. Um, I had some problems with anxiety about a year or so ago. Um, and I thought, well, what's the best way to deal with it is to go to an expert, which I did. And I had some cognitive behavioral therapy, which was eye-opening for me because I needed to know that what I was feeling was natural. And she explained to me a lot about this little thing in our brain called the amygdala. Can you say in layman's terms, this little chimp in our brain and what it does and why it makes us um, react in certain ways to certain situations? Okay, I'll certainly give it a go. Okay, all right. So, so when, when anyone's faced with any situation of danger, uh, then usually a couple, lots of parts of your brain get stimulated, but there's two main brain circuits that sort of come into play, really. Uh, and they send sensory information uh, about the danger that you're experiencing. So if you were... Uh, I don't know, in the middle of a road and heard a car coming, speeding at you, you would respond, or this is what your brain's supposed to respond to. If you say smell a fire or something like that, if you were in work, you, you would begin to start a process in your brain. So uh, so one part of that circuit extends to your, uh, you know, your cerebral cortex or the, out, the outermost part of your brain, which is used for thinking maybe uh, and making decisions. But the other bit, the, uh, the amygdala that you talk about, the base of your brain, potentially, sorry, the hypothalamus is at the base of your brain, the amygdala uh, is central to that emotional processing, so how we perceive a situation. Uh, so the amygdala monitors your bodily's uh, reaction in any situation. So if it's a car speeding at you, it will evaluate that event's emotional significance. Is it going to kill me, for example? Uh, and it organizes a response, potentially, that you may or may not be conscious of because it may have to react unbelievably quickly. So if people have ever felt anxious and panicky, then it, the situation happens really, really quickly. So your amygdala initiates a massive hormonal release very, very quickly. Uh, it'll increase your heart rate. It will increase your blood pressure. Your muscles will tense. And generally what your body's getting ready to do is to leg it. If someone's chasing you with a machete or a car coming at you quickly, are you going to stop and fight and defend yourself as we would against, I don't know, saber-toothed tigers many years ago, or dinosaurs. You mentioned dinosaurs before, I'm so. <laughs> uh, uh, and also, uh, it works. The amygdala is interesting as well, because not only does it produce this response, because it processes emotions, it will also begin to store memories of that emotional event. So if something's triggered off that anxiety response, it will make a note of that, because it will need to produce that again in future. But... If it's a situation that you usually wouldn't cause you to fear for your life, for example, it can still uh, maintain that memory and produce uh, the same physical anxiety response uh, to run or fight, even if it's, I don't know, uh, a letter comes through the door or the thought of going to the shop or whatever it might be. So 
but I hope that helps. I don't know. Just, I think it's absolutely fascinating. You really explain that really, really well because I think you know these feelings that we get. We, it helps to know that sometimes you're not in control of them. It's like a natural reaction. The the signal goes to the amygdala before it gets to the thinking bit. Even it's very quickly and it reacts very quickly as well. So it's a natural feeling, anxiety. And we've got a slide up now um, about anxiety maintenance. Talk us through this, Phil, and how we can um, kind of try and break out of the loops. Okay, certainly. So so if you, if, if you see the slide, you'll see the whatever internal or external event. So what that means is either something you're thinking about as an internal event or the car speeding at you as an external event, perhaps. So how your brain will see that is there's a perceived threat. Now, it'll either be an exaggerated, appropriate, or an inappropriate response to that. So, depending what, so if it's, say, for example, the thought of going to the shop. So, I speak to people all the time who say, I've got to go to this meeting next Thursday, whatever it is, and I start worrying about it a week in advance or days in advance. Uh, so, what they potentially may do to try and moderate that is natural human thinking. We will try to avoid things that make us uncomfortable. So, anxiety works in a logical way, but produces an illogical response. Uh, so if we think, right, I'm not going to this meeting, that's alleviated my anxiety in the short term. If you go around to the bottom of that particular spiral, but what happens is the fear will remove And potentially next time there's another meeting you've got to go to, you will begin to trigger off that same exaggerated response and you'll go round and round again until you, you can try to sort of challenge that anxiety-related belief. So, so at the bottom there, it's about A, knowing the, about the amygdala pro producing a quick response, how you begin to control and manage that by control breathing is one example. Then it's about recognizing the thoughts that produce your anxiety and then how you can begin to challenge those thoughts and reflect on them and actually work out, actually this isn't a logical thought for me and I don't really need to avoid going to a meeting. In fact, start going into that. Sounds very simple. Well, that's a very simplified way of doing it, but that's how you can begin to challenge the spiral. If you don't break the spiral, it will just continue and maintain over a period of time, unfortunately. Which is why things like um, CBT I mentioned earlier kind of help you to break the spiral by making you understand what you're going through. A bit of faith, fear, face the fear and do it anyway. Um, I know that's a famous book as well, isn't it, in self-help. But it's very true that you, you can't break the cycle until you work out what's causing the problem in the first place. Yeah, very much so. I think, I mean, CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, cognitive is just the way you think. And the way you think it influences your behaviour as it does for all of us every day. Uh, but again, it's only if that becomes uh, an inappropriate sort of response or one that you don't want, then you might need to sort of reverse the process. As in all behavioural therapy, it says, if uh, all behaviour is learned and therefore can be unlearned. So, so that's the basis of that. There's always a solution. Absolutely. Right, I want us to move on now from some of the side to, to some of the side effects of stress and anxiety. And in particular... Um, coping mechanisms that people have which not necessarily are positive ones and I'm thinking drugs and alcohol because in a situation like this um, it's easy to open up the wine fridge isn't it if you're lucky enough to have a wine fridge um, yeah. and, and grab a glass of wine and, and that becomes a habit because it's there and you're out of your usual routines or to think right you know I'll have a little bit of a smoke and that'll make me feel a bit better it'll take away the stress but there we get into more cycles. And Owen, you just put up a slide there for us, a poll, explain that. Yeah, so just this is our second of two polls today. Um, people have already started uh, throwing in their answers. Have you honestly drank more alcohol than usual during lockdown? So uh, I'll leave this open for a few minutes just for people to vote on that, simply yes or no. Well, I've just put mine in, I'll be honest, and I'll say I'm a yes. Um, but um, I've be, become aware over the last week or so, especially after talking to Dr. Allen last week, that you know this is a habit that you're getting into that's not a good one. So I've made a choice not to um, continue that habit and to make new routines as well. So Phil, tell us about why we do that, why we turn to alcohol or drugs, and why we feel it's going to be a crutch that, that it isn't. Okay, certainly, yeah. Um, I think... Uh, you're absolutely right. Lots of people will be turning for a drink because, again, people would have gone out for a meal maybe and had a drink or just gone to the pub or whatever they might have done in the past. So, again, people are looking to kind of replace some of that, I think, in terms of how do we maintain some of that entertainment. The main reason people, if they're feeling a little bit anxious, will have a drink is because um, 
uh, alcohol is a muscle relaxant, so you will you will feel the benefits of that pretty quickly within about ten or fifteen minutes, depending on what you what what you're drinking. Uh, but obviously, drinking in moderation is fine. There's no problem with that at all. But again, if you think about going to the wine fridge, then potentially it's looking at you know what what size glass are you doing, how many glasses of wine are you having. Uh, you know, on average, uh, a bottle of wine somewhere between twelve and fourteen percent alcohol by volume if it's like a 70 cl bottle so around about nine or ten units of alcohol in a bottle so uh, if you work out that and the recommended limits are 14 units for men and women in a week uh, if you're drinking i don't know 50 bottles a week that's probably a lot if you're having a couple of glasses a week then that's fine on a couple of occasions uh, so so again that's the main reason that we will do that but i suppose for 50 50 so even split yeah 50% more than usual is a lot from my point of view. Sorry, I'm just thinking about, <laughs> thinking about referrals coming my way. Uh, anyway, um, so in terms of specific anxiety disorders, in my world, working with mental health and drug and alcohol misuse, I know pretty clearly that um, anxiety and low mood are pretty closely linked to drinking alcohol. There's usually a reason why people drink alcohol to excess, and around about 80 or 90% of people who access a drug and alcohol service will certainly have uh, um, symptoms of clinical anxiety and depression. Be because again, you know, people try to block stuff out, they'll try and feel a bit more relaxed than they were before. But again, unfortunately, alcohol is not the greatest one to do that because it magnifies how you feel. So if you ever felt great before you go out and you have a really good time, that's great. However, if you feel bad before you go out and have a drink, the potential is it's gonna magnify that anxiety or that depressed mood. And the things we can do, I mean, you've, you've put here, learn to relax. We talked about um, relaxation a bit earlier on. Eat as well as you can and exercise or be as active as possible. There is a little bit of a spiral here, isn't there? Because when you can't be bothered, when your head is saying, I cannot CBA um, and all of those things, then exercising is not the thing you're going to do. But on the other side of that, as soon as you do it, you feel better. It's just pushing yourself to that moment, isn't it? We're going to talk a little bit about how we motivate ourselves to do that, aren't we? Um, mm -hmm. With our next graphic. I don't know whether you want to talk through any more of those. No, carry on, yeah. Um, yeah, we're looking at the bottom, controlled breathing. We talked about that, you talked about that earlier. Oh, and just talk about getting help if you feel you need it as well, just while we're on that slide. Yeah, yeah, I think across the country now, it's uh, usually quite easy to access cognitive behavioural therapy via EGB. They'll refer you to what's called an an IAPT or an Improving Access to Psychological Therapy service. Uh, they'll deal with more common mental health problems before they become more serious. So uh, again, if you're feeling more stress and anxiety, then what will happen is your GP or fly referral, or you can refer yourself. If you just Google IAPT and whatever area you're in, then potentially you can self-refer. They will speak to you on the phone. They'll do an assessment over the phone. And what they'll do is put in place a, a range of options. So some of those options might be computer-based uh, cognitive behavioral therapy where a therapist might just talk you through that and review you every week as you go through or it might be one-to-one -one sessions again currently over the phone or even via zoom or teams or whatever it might be at the moment uh, and again there's also options around one-to-one -one cbt or medication may be the option again there's loads of things before you get to medication and anything else in my world so again there's lots of stuff that's out there so please accept, you know, access it if you need it or if you know someone who does. Absolutely. Right. So um, people can get anxious, use substances to feel better. Um, so have we talked about, talked through these? Oh, let's see some good questions here. Let's have a little chat through this, Phil. Because um, these are questions we should be asking ourselves, really, if we feel we're on the cusp of having a problem. Yeah, very much so. Again, it's a, it's a quick uh, alcohol screen, uh, sorry, alcohol and drug screen that's used in lots of services, devised in Australia. But... It's just a, just a yes, no answer to each of those things. Again, if you know somebody and you, th you apply those questions to somebody you know or apply them to yourselves, it's just a quick screen to think, well, if you get two of those that are yes answers, then the potential is you might need to sort of investigate it further. So it's just a starting point really to, to think, hmm, do I need to do something about uh, where I'm to at the moment or does somebody else do? Right, great. So... Um Hopefully we'll we'll record we're recording this, aren't we, Owen? So people yeah. can look back and look back through those slides if they want to revisit some of the things we've been talking about here. I want to talk. I know we're running out of time, and we want to talk to uh, 
your questions. But first, I want to talk about this motivational interviewing um, slide that we've got on the screen at the moment, Phil, um, yeah. because when you're talking about stages of change, it reminds me a bit about the stages of grief that we talked about last week, that you go through these stages to get to the place where you want to be, but is isn't necessarily easy to move from one step to the other. So give us a brief kind of praise of what this is about, please. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, I used to smoke many, many years ago, so I can use that as an example. But I smoked for about five or ten years, and then uh, I wasn't thinking, wasn't really bothered about it, so I just carry on smoking. Then obviously you start to think, so that's a pre-contemplation bit in your in your diagram. Then I used to think, oh, this is no good for me. I can't really justify it. So I started. So that's my contemplation stage. I started to prepare of what I was going to do. So I started stopping where I was using smoking in certain situations. Then I took some action and stopped completely. And uh, that's the maintenance bit. So a couple of slip ups along the way, which is common for most people. Uh, so a little bit of a lapse or relapse, but then just found myself back to what had worked before, always learning from your stage of change. So if you slip up, you always learn from what, what's happened there and think, how can I do it differently in the future? Applies to any situation really. We, people, it's certainly a substance misuse So People tend to go from, not thinking about it to thinking about it, thinking right i'm going to do it but they don't put the preparation of the and the action bit in before they just go straight to stopping and that's always a bit of a, a chance that people will slip up very very quickly motivational interviewing is the best approach on the planet it's the most successful uh, i was saying to owen before I, I used it with my teenage kids and, and my children when they were younger it's about getting people's perspective lots of people have negative views of drug and alcohol misuse P people who use drugs and alcohol will hear that all the time so as soon as you go for you must stop. Unfortunately, that doesn't really register. So what you want to be doing is looking at asking people where they're up to in these stages and then working with them at that particular stage. It's about facilitating natural change to happen a bit more quickly than usual. And ultimately, families around people who use drugs or alcohol will want them to stop. The person will want to stop. So going for an approach like motivational interviewing that is based on uh, non-confrontation, not producing resistance, uh, and working with that person about what they want to achieve is massively important. And I do it every day in, my, in the work that I do. And it works. It works, like you say, yeah. I can see that with the weight loss sort of thing as well. We, we all do that. And I suppose there's a lot of people at home now going, you know, I've eaten too much. I need to stop doing that and get into that cycle. But it's that hard bit, isn't it? It's actually making the change. But it works. So follow that, that, that motivational cycle there. Um, I've got some scenarios here, but I'm, I'm aware that we're sort of 20 minutes to go. Oh, do you think we should um, go to questions or what would you suggest at let's this do, let's, let's do one scenario and then, then we'll line up some questions. Okay. All right. So I've got a few scenarios here and they're all kind of graded really um, uh, uh, and trying to sort of take in, into account what most people will be going through with, with a scenario that... Will, you'll be able to relate to. So first one, Stephen is working from home and trying to homeschool the children at the same time. They're aged nine and 13. At first they engaged, but now it's impossible to get them to concentrate on tasks without complaining. Now, when he contemplates home lessons, his heart starts to race. He's come to dread it. What's happening, Phil, with his behavior? How can he take control? Okay, I, I suppose a lot of the country will be currently be getting a much more respect for teachers, I think, at this point in time, because, uh, again, obviously, it's not easy to, to teach, but it's also very difficult to homeschool, especially if you're not prepared for it. So you, you, you're doing a job that you've not been trained to do at very, very short notice uh, and might be feeling out of control with that. Uh, so potentially, um, I don't know, uh, if your kids are begging to return to school, that doesn't encourage you either. Uh, so that will increase your anxiety. So I suppose I'd hark back to some of the slide before around controlling breathing and stuff to, to get time away from that and relax. And remember that actually you're doing the best that you can in a, in a, in a difficult situation. You know, speak to the school, you know, see, seek out their options. I'm sure there'll be flexibility from the school as well. Bear in mind social distancing, of course. But again, it's about building up their own resilience to deal with that excess pressure. It's a bit back before, isn't it? We've got a specific cause, you've got stress. Can we deal with the cause of the stress? So potentially, uh, you know, maybe looking on the State of Mind website, there's a, a, a practical guidance about resilience on there on the resources section. Uh, again, just looking at those simple tips that will help them for the future. But yeah, a really common scenario I would imagine at the moment. 
Yeah, I'll go on to another one now. Um, scenario two. Gina too is working from home, but because of domestic demands, she's finding that her actual work day has shifted from nine to five to more like two to ten. So her schedule's out of kilter. To help her sleep, she has a glass of wine or three at night. Does she have a problem? Okay, I, I, again, I think it's just about judging where someone's up to. So again, if you think back to what we were saying before, how big is the glass? Is it a big, uh, you know, magnum of wine? A bit like uh, Owen's in drinking there. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> sorry. Uh, you know, it's about how much and how often and so fits every night. Three glasses of wine might be three or four units a night. So if you're talking 21, maybe more. Uh, units a week then you're in a potential way you're bordering on increasing your consumption that if that becomes the norm to relax then unfortunately that can build and build and then become much more of a problem so again it's just check out check it out you know check out the questions we had earlier in the in the in the slides before about cutting down etc feeling guilty and then um, again we've got practical guidance around uh, improving sleep if sleep's an issue because obviously you can start to about a change uh, work pattern and daily work pattern so you know, look at practical advice for that as well. Yeah, and it's being honest with yourself as well. I think we can be in denial sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, alcohol is just so socially acceptable, isn't it? Uh, I mean, it's legal, so there's no reason why it shouldn't be socially acceptable. But it can also be a problematic thing for many, many people. So it's just being aware of it, uh, like any other thing, really, and just monitoring it and making sure it doesn't become too often. Well, we'll whip through this third scenario while we're moving through these quite quickly. Um, Beth has a job uh, start lined up for September, a new job. Before lockdown, she was excited about the new challenge, but now she's finding that she's dreading it. The more she prepares for the new role, the more she thinks she's unqualified and out of her depth. What's going on here? Well, okay, I, suppose, uh, I, think, I suppose the pandemic's led to uh, everyone questioning their own roles, uh, and certainly in society reflected on what they've been doing and where they're up to I guess uh, also told to be careful about contracting a virus so, so all of those things play into obviously you're going to go into a potential new environment a new job role people will always be uh, uh, more anxious about entering a new situation it's always anxiety provoking for anybody I guess uh, will will the company have uh, put in social distancing restrictions or not you know so do they look after the staff so I suppose Beth should remember that, I don't know, all employers are trying to give people, uh, you know, the best chance to be successful. If she's had an interview and been successful, they must think she's good enough to do the job. Uh, so again, uh, anxious thoughts and producing those exaggerated response again. It's about that self-worth and that self-belief. So maybe backtracking on some of the slides we've had today might be really useful just to check that out a little bit and break that a little bit of a spiral that's building. Yeah, that's a really good point, isn't it? You have to remember why you got the job in the first place. Yeah, you didn't get it because, you know, it was 50-50. You got it because you deserved it. Okay, let's move on to some questions then now. Owen, over to you. What have we got? Thank you, Angela. So we've got a few questions flowing in on the Q&A panel now, so that's great. Keep those coming. Um, first of all, I'm just going to turn to a couple that we had submitted in advance, Phil, if that's okay. Of course, um, yeah. And Gillian Rigby asks... Phil, will mental health and physical health ever be comparable in conversation? The reason for her asking is that um, people can become more defensive and sometimes offended regarding you asking about their mental health, but not so their physical health. Right, okay, well, good question. Uh, right, okay, uh, nationally there's a talk of um, parity of esteem, which means putting physical and mental health on the same sort of level. So I'm guessing that's going to take some time to put in place. I suppose for us in state of mind, I think uh, what we tend to talk about is rather than physical health and mental health, which mental health can have a negative connotation, we'll talk about physical fitness, which is good for your mental fitness, but also mental fitness. So what you're doing is change the terminology and language can certainly be quite important in this by changing the, changing the scenario, changing the perception of the conversation. So mental fitness, certainly in rugby league over the last 10 years has become uh, a bit of a watchword to have a good state of mind. You've got to be mentally fit to perform at the highest level. So uh, the more that that sort of seeps through into society, the more you've got Prince William talking to blokes in a football changing room from a men's point of view, the more you've got people talking about a range of issues, then people are just going to go, well, yeah, it's the norm, isn't it? To be, You need to be physically fit. You need to go out, be active, eat well, all of those things. If I have a day, well... Your five, five a day in mental fitness is around connecting with people, observing stuff as well. 
So doing the same sort of thing. So I think parity of esteem is on its way. You can't avoid it. Mental fitness is important and it's definitely going to be on a par. So no problem whatsoever. I think I'd absolutely back that up, Phil, with, um, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one to have kind of realised that, that some of some of my more alpha male friends, in inverted commas, have even started now talking to me about the work that I do with, with you guys and, and mental health generally and asking for perhaps some support from us as a charity within their their football team or their sports club. And, and I think that that whole conversation is starting to shift in, in the right direction. Um, but obviously it takes time, doesn't it, to get there? Um, good stuff. Another question we had in in advance from Ollie Lark. Ollie, I believe you're with us this morning, so thank you for, for joining and for asking this question. Um, Ollie said, Phil, as a regular attendee of the offload programme in Warrington, I realise the importance of good mental health. Do you ever think we'll see a time when programmes like offload are fully funded by government rather than having to rely on, on applications to other sort of funding bodies? It's proven to save lives. Um, and maybe just give us a bit of background to offload, Phil, if that's okay. Yeah, certainly. Uh... I can definitely give you a background to offload uh, as one of the authors of it with uh, Mobility Care. So um, potentially it's a men's mental fitness program that runs out of, so for Warrington, it runs out of the changing rooms at Warrington Wolves Rugby League Club, which is a, a fantastically neutral venue, which is great. So it, it sort of destigmatizes what, if you will, uh, men getting access to mental fitness using messages that land well and language that's used rather than come to my clinic. People don't come to my community mental health clinic. It's the most unexciting title to invite people to, but they might go to Warrington Wolves dressing room. So offload's a fantastic thing. Ollie, I think um, it's a great question to ask. I think you, you will know that, or you might know that uh, offload was a three, uh, two year pilot. That pilot's now been continued to be funding. It's now been funded in St. Helens. So St. Helens are, are gonna run an offload. Obviously social distancing changes apart. Uh, so it's already becoming part of that fabric. People across the country are looking at uh, projects like offload because if they work and they can improve men's mental fitness or anyone's mental fitness then the potential is it's definitely going to become more of the mainstream and it will just become a normal part of funding like any other service so yeah absolutely confident ollie that's definitely going to happen lovely stuff thank you ollie for the question um phil next one uh, i'll go to is from danny skullthorpe our colleague Danny, morning Danny. What's the difference uh, between getting anxious at different individual events and more generally having anxiety? Okay, I think uh, it's, it's probably a bit, we were harking back to before Danny, so a good question. Uh, stress is around a specific cause that may make your, your stress levels increase at a particular event, uh, whereas anxiety will be uh, that, that build up of that stress without dealing with the cause of that. So those anxieties will remain and build and build and build until unfortunately it might just make people feel anxious on a regular basis. But it's a really good distinction to make and a good question to ask. So thank you for that. Lovely. And then um, sticking specifically with anxiety, Paul Corliss asks, do you think anxiety in the workplace is getting more understood? Uh, I've suffered friends with anxiety for a long time, but I feel I couldn't ring into work with, uh, with the reason of, of absence with my anxiety is bad today. But if I had a stomach bug, that would be an easier phone call to make. Okay, all right. great question. Morning, Paul. Thanks for that. Uh, in terms of the workplace, I think uh, there's a big recognition nationally and internationally that uh, you, you need to sort of begin to manage the mental fitness of your workforce because if you don't, uh, big sort of uh, absenteeism or sickness and absence is, is linked to anxiety and depression. Uh, if you look at, on the health and safety executive national figures that are updated every year, you'll find 40 to 50 percent of all uh, sickness and absences around anxiety and depression so there's a big economic driver for, for employers to want to improve the mental fitness as well as the physical fitness of their employees so I think ultimately that's definitely going to become much more again mainstream as before because it costs money so for every pound you invest in um, uh, workplace mental health or mental fitness support what you get back is £10 in productivity. So that's a study that was done in uh, Australia around firefighters. So it's a really, really interesting sort of phenomena. And it's the financial thing that will change it completely. Uh, a lot of people, it's interesting you mentioned about feeling anxious and not rigid and sick for anxiety, what you would for a stomach bug. There's also a, a phenomena known as presenteeism where people are in work, but just not as productive. So again, other than people being off sick, there's also the fact that people aren't as productive. So if you look after your workforce and their mental fitness, 
you're going to get a much more productive workforce and better results and you're going to make more profits and that's what will change it so yeah no problem with it, and i just to add something on there as well phil with i think links into that a lot of it is about culture and workplace culture you know if you can engender a culture where people feel they can first of all talk to you if they've got a problem or you feel excited about coming to work because failure isn't a sign of an ability to do something it's learning on the path to getting somewhere else so creating a culture where people feel um, as though they, they're allowed to make make mistakes sometimes and on the path to becoming more um, effective um, changing cultures can be really important yeah massively so again if you just think <laughs> uh, you know um, I think uh, George Riley was doing a podcast I think with Reese Lyon for Wakefield uh, and I think during that conversation, he was saying that um, if he'd have had access to stuff that was around now in terms of mental fitness and mental health support, like sporting chance as a professional player, then his life would have been much easier and he would have performed better day to day. So I think if you can change a culture as macho as rugby league around from, no, we don't talk about anything, to lots of rugby league players openly talking about how they feel, then you can definitely change culture. It's like anything, everyone can change, anything's changeable, so therefore positivity can happen, no problem. Good stuff, thank you, Phil. Um, and if I can go to one from Joe Phillips now. Uh, hi, Joe, good to see you join us today. Um, Joe says, hi, boss. Many people contact me about PTSD. I can only advise from my own experiences, but what would your clinical advice be for anyone that has PTSD symptoms? Thank you. Okay, all right, thanks for that, John, good morning. Um, I suppose for me, I think post-traumatic stress disorder is relatively common, unfortunately, uh, usually as a result of a particular traumatic incident. Uh, there's, there's lots of things you can do around PTSD. You could probably go online and, and look at the symptoms and give yourself an idea whether you think you're experiencing or re-experiencing it in something that's happened in your life over and over again, replaying it, replaying it in different ways. There's lots of different elements of post-traumatic stress disorder. However, nationally speaking, from NICE Guides, the National Institute of Clinical and Health Excellence, there are two specific uh, approaches that would be helpful for PTSD. Uh, number one is called trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. We touched on CBT earlier on in the session. Uh, and the other one is something called EMDR, or eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is, again, a relatively quick uh, intervention, but, again, has seemed to have really, really uh, beneficial results for uh, different elements of post-traumatic stress disorder. So there's lots of support out there. Lots of IAP services will have access to EMDR and cognitive behavioral therapy. So it should be quite easy to access those types of support. And if they're more complex elements of post-traumatic stress disorder, then you can lead into other service provision. So there's more psychological provision elsewhere. So lots of stuff around, lots of easily accessible stuff. So yeah, if you know anybody uh, that's experiencing that or experienced it, then please encourage him to go and get help and support. Lovely stuff. Thanks, Phil. And thanks, Joe. Um, like we said, this this recording will be up on YouTube, um, hopefully later this afternoon. So uh, if you want to refer back to anything Phil's um, said or signposted to, um, go, obviously go and find it on, on the recording. Um, had another question through, Phil. Um, this is a bit of a scenario based question actually so thank you very much um spencer spencer williams for for typing this in for us um i'll read it word for word i think phil um i'm a big lad my wife is very small i suffer from arthritis of the spine and hips after playing rugby until i was 42 through wear and tear i also suffer from chronic depression and suicidal thoughts when we go shopping my wife does all the lifting and carrying I get some really horrible looks and on several occasions have been challenged because I, I'm not doing any of the lifting. This destroys any confidence I may have had. Should I defend myself or should I just duck my head and leave? I hate the thought of having to justify myself. How should I or how can I prepare or react to this? Thank you. Okay, really good question, Spencer. So, okay, I think this sort of strikes back to what we were discussing earlier as well about, it's about perception, isn't it? Perception and self-worth in terms of creating stress or discomfort with that particular scenario you described. Uh, I suppose there's lots of things that you wouldn't ask, would you? So, so, so say for example, if someone was in a wheelchair, for example, you wouldn't expect them to get up and, and do a dance if a song came on in the supermarket. However, your perception is that other people might be judging you at this point. Likelihood is they're probably just busy with their own world, worrying about coronavirus and worrying about their own shopping and the bills. However, your perception might be, if you're feeling a little bit more anxious, is that you're just 
uh, very, very much more aware of the situation. Uh, it might just be around looking at challenging some of those thoughts or thinking about what you're thinking about whenever your 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 part your wife's loading the the trolley. What are you doing? What are you looking around for? Are you looking at people looking at you? You know, what's your thought process in that situation? Perhaps writing it down, monitoring whether from say naught to ten, not being not very good, uh, and ten being really not bothered about this situation. And then maybe try to reflect on that the, the, the day afterwards, that you're the few hours, probably the 24 hours after to give you time to reflect a little bit more. I think, you know, was that an appropriate potential thought? You know, would people are really, really looking at me or were they actually just busy with their own world? And that's why perception is absolutely crucial, I think, with anxiety and low mood. How we view any situation dictates our response. So if you went in there and thought, actually, I'm trying to build my wife up to be the greatest bodybuilder in the world, uh, and you had that about everybody else in the shop, you really wouldn't be concerned. However, I, I understand it's very, very difficult when you're you know, thinking about things very, very negatively. But as I said before, negative thinking can always be recognized and challenged and therefore be changed. So I suppose that's what the, the approach I might sort of look to, Spencer. But fantastic question and a really, really interesting uh, perspective and a very difficult perspective, I know. I agree with that, Phil. I think that's a really interesting one, that Spencer, because I think we can all take that scenario and put it in our own lives and think, oh, what are people thinking about me at this moment? And I think we need to stop doing that sometimes. It's easier said than done, but, and you're absolutely right, the vast majority of people are not even noticing. We have to stop thinking, and I'm saying this for myself and for everybody else in my life as well, that, you know, what we're feeling is something that everybody else can sense, and it's not necessarily the case, is it? You know, it's perception is so... So spot on there, you're right. I think sometimes as well, um, Spencer's probably experienced this, um, it might not necessarily be a, a kind of an aggressive challenge from someone, but someone might just kind of come out with a, a so-called smart, funny line, which isn't really funny, you know, letting her do all the legwork kind of thing. And, 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 and they're difficult to deal with because it's not even like you've been kind of challenged directly. It's just someone kind of trying to be humorous or they think they're being funny. So I think that that can make things a bit difficult but sometimes it's just about knowing in advance if that scenario happens what you will do to, to react to it in a positive way and, and, a, and a, a kind of de-escalation way I think as well because nobody wants to have a public confrontation I'm sure. Um, okay just one uh, or two quick ones if we've time to squeeze them in. Um, Danny Sculthorpe uh, asked Danny, uh, Phil, when I get asked to help someone, I know later down the line it's made a difference. I get a massive buzz. You've done this for decades now. Do you still get that buzz? And he also asked uh, prior to this session, what's it like to be an MBE, Phil? <laughs> Thanks for that, Danny. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think you ever lose the buzz from helping somebody out. It's a great way to make yourself feel good in your own self. Uh, when you get feedback, which I know you get really positive feedback, Danny, from sessions, it does make you feel fantastic, you know. It could be the simplest thing. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I, I always remember once, uh, I've always taught alongside people. Uh, I'm lucky enough to teach about mental health and drug and alcohol, and I've always taught alongside people uh, with mental health and drug and alcohol problems in the past. And I always remember some somebody who I talked with many, many times, uh, and he said to me, um, he just sort of said it as part of this session, he said, uh, when, he, when he saw me professionally, he said, and you'd be all right because... Uh, you actually offered me a glass of water when I came in, asked me if I was okay, if I was com comfortable. And he remembered that six years later. So so having that sort of, um, I don't know, positive interaction with somebody can make a massive difference and make a really big chase for anybody's day. Just telling somebody that they're okay during any one day uh, or they've done really, really well during any one day can make a massive difference. So, yeah, never lose the buzz, Danny. Um, MBE was, a, I don't know, a complete bolt, shut, you know, both from the blue, really. Um, uh, it's never been anything that I'd ever aspired to by any means. But it, it was a great experience for my family and stuff. But looks good for the charity. Looks good on my uh, email signature. I'm hoping to use it if I ever book a restaurant, a meal in a restaurant at some point. <laughs> ever again. Um, just very quickly, because I'm aware of time, uh, we had one other one from Gillian Rigby, Phil. Um, she said, sadly, male suicide numbers continue to increase. There are more mental health charities and sources of help than ever before if people use them. But do you feel new approaches are needed, particularly in areas that have a higher incidence of suicide? And I know we're, we're working on projects together at the moment that are geographically focused to that, to that point, aren't they? Definitely so. A great question, Gillian, I think. Um, 
a bit like uh, Ollie was mentioning before about offload. If you don't know about offload, I think what will happen is uh, new approaches are, are already sort of uh, getting up and running. Everton in the community do great work over on Merseyside. There's lots of stuff happening nationally. Uh, in terms of suicide numbers, unfortunately, I think uh, I think our current suicide numbers are a conservative estimate anyway. You're probably going to see a change and an increase in those numbers because the actual way in which uh, coroners record the verdicts now is changing from a uh, beyond reasonable doubt scenario in courts to uh, in all probability. So you're probably going to see an increase in those numbers, which will probably just be a reflection of what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, but I think any sort of innovative uh, uh, approaches to sort of deal with male suicide, males, you know, 75% of suicides are still male. So again, offload, any sort of uh, men's... I think, I know, any sort of intervention that gets to a bloke in the place where he'll be on, on terms that he's happy to sort of uh, talk about, then great. I, I, I talk to blokes in car parks anywhere. I'll talk to anybody in any situation. Uh, I'll give you an example why I think things can change. Um, in the very first year when we did stay at mine, we were at a rugby league ground and uh, with one of my colleagues at a marquee. And some, uh, a lady came up with this bloke who said to me, he said, I've no idea what stay at mind is, but it was just in a match. And he said, um, or she said to me, I'm really worried about my friend. He's, um, he, his son took his own life and he, he's been talking about joining him in the last couple of weeks. So I'm really worried about him. Spoke to him for about half an hour and uh, then he buzzed off at a match, which is really uncomfortable for me because I get to you know, follow people up on a regular basis. He came back on his own at the end of the game as we were putting the marquee down. He said, he said, oh, I really, really appreciate you talking to me before. He said, uh, this was going to be my last game of rugby league. I was going to take my own life tonight, but I'm not going to do that now. And he buzzed off. And, and for me, that's an unbelievable sign of some, an approach that will change suicidal uh, numbers going forward. But it's about recognition and talking. And uh, since that time, a couple of years later, we were back at the same ground. The guy came up to me, gave me a big hug that made me somewhat emotional and tearful and said, this is my other son, I'm about to be a granddad. So things change all the time. And I think suicide numbers will always change when positive, innovative approaches are there. Amazing. Um, just very quickly, the last one I think we've got uh, from Ollie Lark again. Um, Ollie asks, Phil, a quick one on working from home versus the old world of working from the office. Uh, I found this quite difficult at times recently. I miss seeing people in my team in the flesh. Um, any, any tips on that adjustment? Yeah, it's a good one, Ollie. Yeah. We, we did a, a Zoom meeting with all the State of Mind presenters yesterday, and it's just great to catch up and see each other sort of thing, uh, even though it's not face-to-face. -face. I think it's like anything, any adjustment that we do uh, is always difficult to deal with. So... Uh, again, it's just re resetting our goals a little bit as well. And so, so, so for me, uh, I, I've not seen my mates face to face for God knows how long now, three months. However, we're going for a socially distanced lads night out about 20 foot away from each other on Saturday night. So I'm really looking forward to it. So ultimately we'll adapt, uh, Ollie, and we'll, we'll get back to those sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the camaraderie getting teams. I've been working all the way through this, so I've not got that because I've been in, in teams in the NHS all the way through. So, But it's also different being in, in work as well because it's a, a scary place for be, people to be, or it has been in the last few weeks. So people are adjusting to that as well, I think. So there's lots of different adjustments taking place. Human beings are great at adapting, so therefore we'll all adapt at some point and we'll sort of work through this without a doubt. Great. And just very finally, and then I'll uh, just... Uh announce next week's session. Um, Phil Vivas our stock. What is the saying, it's always your year about? <laughs> <laughs> it's always our year, Phil, it's always our year. Well, all I can say to that, Mr Vivas, is it was our year last year. I think we won the <laughs> challenge against somebody, but I can't remember who we played. <laughs> Love it. Okay, lovely stuff. Um, so I'll just quickly announce uh, we've got our third and final session, sadly, in this current sort of mini series of Ask the Doc, scheduled for the same time, same place next week. So Wednesday, 17th of June. And this time it's with um, the current chair of State of Mind Sport, 
um, uh, Claire, Dr. Claire Carson, sorry. And uh, Claire is also the Associate Director of Operations at Greater Manchester Mental Health Trust. So um, fantastic insight Claire will have for us next week. We're going to be focusing that session on issues of loneliness and isolation. They'll be the core subject matter. So we're looking forward to that. And um, I've posted the uh, provisional registration link for that into the chat. So before we close the session today, grab that link and, uh, and feel free to register in advance for it. Angela, I'll just hand back over to you for a final uh, thank you and goodbye. Yeah, on that loneliness and isolation, we might not be um, suffering from it as much and you watching might not be, but it might be really useful if you know somebody, elderly people, people who are neighbours, that you might be able to find out things from next week that you can help those people with as well. It's all really about taking something from these sessions, but also giving as well. So if you want to um, sign up and, and get involved uh, just to learn how you can help other people, then that's as, as good as being taking some of the help with yourself from from what we we are able to say i've really enjoyed it today phil thank you so much for your insights there i think it's been such an eye-opener as well just to understand what anxiety and stress really is that we are animals at the end of the day and our bodies take over but we can take control of them as well so that's been absolutely fascinating so same place same time next week Absolutely, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll welcome Claire to the session next week. Um, thank you again, Phil. You've been absolutely inspirational as always. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, I always think I, I must have learned everything by now that, that I can from you, but it's never the case. There's always other, other stuff you come out with. So thank you so much. Um, and just to play us out this week, uh, in agreement with Phil, actually, because obviously Phil was co-founder of State of Mind, um, we're going to play the very first campaign film we produced. And this was my first involvement with a charity as well. Uh, when I first spoke to Phil way back in 2011. Um, so this was a, the, the short trailer version of the very first State of Mind film to introduce the charity to the, to the world. Uh, so we'll play you out with that. But yeah, we'll look forward to welcoming you all next week and please spread the word and we'll hopefully get a, a nice number of people along to that session. Thanks ever, ever so much for everyone's in, interactions and questions. Thank you. <laughs>